Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in to watch my show. Today, I'm very excited to be introducing you to Paul Kenny. He and I have been friends on Facebook for a very long time, and I've been an admirer of his tie-dye for a very long time. So I'm super excited to be sharing his story with you here on YouTube. So, Paul, if you will tell us your story and a little bit about how you got into tie-dye. Okay, so the first time I did tie-dye, this is just kind of a one-off thing, was I was 11 years old. It was 1968, living in Nebraska, and I used RIT dye and some rubber bands and, you know, made a pink t-shirt with some rings on it and annoyed the heck out of my mom with the mess in the bathroom. Okay, fast forward to 1982. Um, I'm in graduate school at UCLA. I met my wife, who's an under, the girl who is, woman who is going to be my wife, um, earlier that year, and she'd actually moved in with me over the summer and met all my friends. And we were both, the Grateful Dead is going to come up repeatedly while we're talking about tie-dye because my tie-dye has been heavily influenced by my Grateful Dead experience. And without the Grateful Dead, I wouldn't have been doing tie-dye and a lot of other people wouldn't. Anyway, and so she liked my deadhead friends. And so she said, because she was raised properly, she said, let's give everyone holiday gifts. So this is December, 1982. And she said, I'll make a cute little silk screen and uh, you can do some tie-dye, we can put them on. I'm like, okay, that's not that hard. And you could go down to the craft store and buy these little envelopes of reactive dye. And I get some of that and put some rubber bands around a shirt and blah, 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 do the dip and pull it out. There's no pattern. And I'm like, what the heck? Okay, at that point, I'm like, okay, I can do this. You know, and then you go back out and do it again. And you know, so, so they're just, we're two color dips. and. Um, gave them to our friends who liked them when we were to the New Year's show there, you know. And someone walks up to me and says, uh, well, I can, let me show you one of the shirts. You know, somebody walks up to me and says, where'd you get that shirt? I'd buy one if you had one. And I'm like, what? You know, and so the original shirts look like, you know, so this is like an example. If it's not my first shirt, you know, it's very similar. So we had a little bear on there. So we said, okay, the next set of shows we go to, they're like, sometime in March or February in Las Vegas. And I took like 30 shirts and sold them for like 15 bucks each in about 35 minutes. Made like all this money in the parking lot. And you're like, okay, I, this is, that was fun. This, you know, way safer than selling other stuff at a Grateful Dead show. And, you know, it'll come out again and again, which is, it, I'll say this about why, one of the reasons we did it was like, yeah, you did the money, but all of a sudden you had something to do while you're hanging out. And so the Grateful Dead was this scene that occurred out in the parking lot and people there and walking. So you're contributing to the scene. That was part of it. And it gave you a chance to talk to people, which is one of the things I've really liked about tie-dye is you meet all these people. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I got started. Then it, it kept evolving. You know, we went from everyone's making spirals. I learned how to make spirals. You know, was I very good at it? No, but at least I tried. So an inside out example of an, one of my old spirals. So this, you're looking at stuff from the, you know, late eighties right now. Mid -80s, so wonderful. 80s. Yeah. I have quite a collection of stuff, both mine and other people's. It's kind of like, it's a matter. It's kind of a problem. I have so much stuff. <laughs> and so then I'm walking out of a Grateful Dead Ventura concert one time. It was a great place to see him at the beach in Ventura. And there's these people selling tie-dye there. And this is the shirt, actually. That, and it was this, uh, it was, uh, let's see. It was oh, called beautiful. Symmetry of Tie-Dye. And so they have a silk screen on it. But it really hit me. It was like, look at those lines and things like that. I, I really liked it. And I was sitting there looking at the shirt, you know. And I didn't have any money back then, you know, 15 bucks for a shirt. And my wife is like, and I couldn't walk away from it. She finally just said, just buy the darn thing. Okay, I bought it. And, and then, so a lot of my style was me trying to, at first trying to figure out how do these guys do this and imitate it. I was fascinated by all the detail because I'd seen, you know, spirals and stuff like that. Let me see what else I got here. Oh, so... And then there was another, so this is like sometime in 82 at a, at a Grateful Dead show, uh, 
the Greek. And this is uh, uh, made by these people called The Farm. I think they came out of Tennessee, but they were some of the first people you saw doing good tie-dye with Procyon dye and selling it outside of concerts. I had a spiral by these guys, but I lost it. So you could see the V there. And I said, hmm, I like that. You know, it's so my first time trying to imitate it. You know, things like that. Okay, I almost like this shirt, but you know, that I I, so I did a lot of I did a lot of things like this. It's um it's only three colors. I would squirt on uh blue and yellow and then dip them red. You know, so for a long time I only did three colors. You know, here's you know, I got fancier and fancier, you know. And so here you can actually see my tie has evolved. You know, this is the tie I normally do. So that's so my tie kind of got settled down. I mostly, as I say, I'm a one trick pony. You know, I only do one thing. I don't do spirals. I don't do spiders. I don't do scrunches. I don't do stitch work. And when I do do those things in practice, it's like, oh God, am I horrible at it? I can't spiral. For the life. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, it's stuff. I do all the gosh, okay. You know, oh, here's you know a shirt I made like that. Wore this a lot, just loved it. This one was actually very early on. I did this with dental floss, you know, and you learn pretty quick that dental floss cuts up your hands and you can't use it. So, and it's quite expensive on. too. Oh, yeah. It's like, well, first you start off and you don't even worry about it. You're just trying it. And then you're saying, I'm not going to make 20 shirts with dental floss, you know, and then you start looking for what's the easiest thing to, cheapest thing to tie with that works. And so, I started using fish line. Uh, here's another example. One of the shirts, it's a lot of white, you know, I didn't, it, it was, it was, you know, okay. So I, I like that. I think it's you know, I had white in it. These are, these are examples of things. And then, then you know, here's one more. The other thing you could do with these things was, uh, you know, you, after you did the, sh you know, the uh, silk screen, you'd color them in with fabric paint. Yeah. And it would give you something to do while you're waiting in line to get into a Grateful Dead concert because you would spend hours waiting because it was uh, festival seating. So deadheads lined up forever for tickets and stuff. You needed something to do. So you sit there with fabric paints, you know, and paint your sh paint shirts and stuff like that. I saw other people doing it. Um, okay, fast forward even further. And so I kind of have this tie down and this way to, to you know, do these three color shirts. But, you know, it's like, you know, an application and a dip. And I did a lot of shirts like that. Um, and then uh, these friends of mine who went to graduate school up in Berkeley and were living in an apartment in Oakland, apartment house. house. And the guy, you know, they're up on the second floor. There's people on the first floor. And there's so many down in the basement. A guy named Tom Fortmeyer, who's out of the Navy and making his living selling tie-dye on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, which is, you know, back in the, this is like probably late 80s or something like that. And this guy, you know, after, after a while, we eventually we ended up going on like family vacations with him and things like that. This guy was a, you know, so he was a small scale pro and then he became a much larger scale pro. So he's one of the first people I ran into that I knew personally who was professional. And so his studio was like 1500 square feet. And uh, he bought a, he was able to buy a, you know, 300 something thousand, $400,000 house because making tie dye and wow. because, well, also he married a rich girl. So that okay. helped a lot. <laughs> she, and, but, uh, um, and so because he was interested in doing, oh shoot, he's still there. Yes. Darn. I'm still okay, here. I, I, I just swiped something and. Anyway, so this guy, Tom Fortmeyer, because he's making his living and, uh, you know, guy went to the Navy after he got a high school education, was smart enough to say, I'm going to go learn more about making tie-dye. So he actually signed up for a class that was offered by ICI Chemicals, Imperial Chemical um, Industries, I think. And they were the actual inventors of Procyon dyes in England back in the 50s. And he went and took a three-day class about how to use their dyes. And most of it probably went over his head. He's not a chemist or any of that things. But uh, he told them, oh, I do tie dye. I, I wanna use it for tie dye. And they said, oh, this is the method you wanna use. And so that's where I learned this particular method of dyeing that I call pariah style that we tell about, tell people about. 
And a lot of them, when you tell them that's how I die, they don't mm -hmm. believe you. They say, how did, that doesn't work? Because we, I'll tie a shirt up. I tie wet because it's easier to handle the shirts. Let them dry. Then you squirt on a, a formulated liquid dye. I use urea, a little bit of cal calcine oil, some thickener. I, I work that out a bit. You let the dye soak in, and then you put the soda ash on afterwards. And everyone says, but that doesn't work. You know, everyone, most people like dip the shirt in soda ash beforehand, let it dry and stuff. So they have the soda ash in the shirt beforehand. Okay. But it, it's, really, it's really hard to tie a shirt with soda ash in it. It screws yes. up your hands. You can't tie yes. tight. Yes. And so I said, this gets around that. Not to mention, you're able to, I'm able to, I've separated the two processes. Uh, so there's the part where you tie the shirt and the part where you dye the shirt. So you don't have to do them at the same time. So typically I will tie for, you know, weeks and weeks until I have enough shirts to actually sit there and do a dye session. And then I do dye sessions until I run out of shirts, but it allows you to separate the two things. And you can, you know, because you're tying, you know, some people tie dry, you can tie in the back of your car and things like that, yes. you know, in the back of a car while you're traveling and stuff like that. You can tie while you're sitting someplace and people say, what are you doing? You know, and then you're trying in the car, you have them in the car and they're up on the dashboard drawing and people are like, what are those things? You know, I, 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 you know, so, you know, one of my shirts tied looks like, you know, this nubby animal, you know, so that's an XL. That's fantastic. You know, that's it's like, beautiful. It's, yeah, no, they take this, this probably took me an hour to tie, you know, so there's an incredible amount of time going. That's why I don't feel bad about showing people how to do what I do because- yes. There's, there's no way someone's going to make hundreds and hundreds of shirts, yes. you know, so everybody who does it is like, they have to go through the same amount of pain as I do. Yes. And so, and anyway, so that's, that's kind of how I got started. And then, oh, and then in 2015, I'm down, you know, and so we had, you know, kids, right, you know. And you're kind of cut into the tie dyeing and going to the Grateful Dead. Jerry Garcia passed away, uh, you know, um, I... You know, my main way that I sold was at Grateful Dead concerts. This is before the internet, right? And so you'd go there and have a bag of 25 or 50 shirts and sell them for 20 bucks and pay for your tickets, your beer, all kinds of things. It was great. And like I said, you get to walk around and talk to people. I have so many stories about, you know, selling shirts to people. Um, and then sometime in the early 90s, somewhere in there near the end of the whole thing so there's this guy from indiana i'd sold him a shirt and so i'd be standing there with a bunch of shirts at any grateful dead show this guy would hunt me down and buy everything it cost every time literally okay. he would come up other people he would grab the shirts out of other people's hands <laughs> buy everything i had it cost you know for cash and i i could go into the show and you're like you a while you're like you know this took all the fun out of it uh -huh. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, I show up, I get a whole bunch of money and I go in the car, you know, I don't get to talk to people. But yes. at the same time, you know, uh, tie dye is art. It's fun. It's also money. You know, so so that was kind of interesting. But then 95, that scene shut down. We had kids, couldn't go out. You know, my tie dyeing slowed down. Of course, you know, all my kids wore tie dye, tons of it, mm -hmm. and had tie dye tapestries in the house. And you sell it to, you know, your friends and things like that. But it wasn't quite the same. Um, then... And, you know, eventually the kids got older. We could start going back to concerts and, and carrying along. But the main thing is my oldest kid, you know, he, they grew up with it, right? And so you try and like, here, you should learn how to do this. And yeah, you know, they do a little bit, but they never, you know, were that interested in it. There was just something in their life they took for granted. Well, he goes off to college and needless to say, they go off to college and start experimenting with drugs and all kinds of music and blah, blah. And they suddenly realize, wow, this tie dye is cool. And they wear my tie dye around and they're like, wow, all these people are asking me questions about it. And so <laughs> I started getting, you know, okay, kids. So I go down to visit them in Santa Barbara one time. And uh, I, I basically show a room full of people how to tie my shirts and give them verbal instructions on how to dye. And I'd shown people how to do this like two or three times before and they're always very interested until they find out how much work it is. And then they do it once or twice and quit. So I figured same thing with these kids, you know? Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you start tying a shirt, you find out, well, that's a lot of work. How much time do I want to spend a, not these guys within a week, they're starting to generate tie dye, 
wow. you're not bad at it either. You know, so, and then he said, hey, dad, you should go on Facebook, you know, because I was on Facebook to talk to my friends and stuff. He said, there's tie-dye groups on Facebook. And I'm like, yeah, like, what the heck, Facebook, people doing tie-dye, you know, I, at this point, I was already uh, considered myself to be quite good at tie-dye, and that most people were kind of, eh. you know, I'm like, yeah, who cares? I'll, I'll show up just to show off a little bit, right, you know, and rub it in that it's like, yeah, you think you do tie-dye, look at this. Well, you show up on Facebook and all of a sudden you're like, holy cow, there's a whole <laughs> world out there of people doing tie-dye. And they just keep coming up one <laughs> after another. You know, you're like, here's, you know, and then all of a sudden all these tie-dyers want to trade with you and find things out. And you're like, well, this is really different. You know, up till then I'd, you know, look at my Facebook like once every three or four days to see what my friends are. Now I'm on Facebook. You probably can tell. It's like, you know. 15 hours a day looking at Facebook. Everyone's like, why do you spend so much time on Facebook? Oh, it's tie-dye, man. You know, you've got to find <laughs> out who's doing what right now. You know, it's like, bam, bam. And then let's see. Oh, the other thing is, is, yeah, the Facebook thing about it. Oh, let me show you, you know, before I get too far away from it, Tom Fortmeyer shirts, the guy showed me that style. So this is something he did a long time ago. That's, this is, hey, this for me. He made this for me just on purpose. He usually did spirals and he did um, like just shirts that were, uh, you know, like this is a rayon button down. It's just the back. I can't really hold it up right, you know, but he would do shirts like this. So this is like two colors squirted on on a scrunch with rubber bands and then dipped, I think, in purple. Um, this guy, you go over to his house, he would do 100, 200 shirts a night. Yes. You know, it was crazy. You know, he, he'd go to shows and sell $10,000 worth of tie-dye a, a day. Wow. You know, he, he was a real pro. Yeah, I know watching him do, and he also went through the whole thing, you know, uh, optimizing the process. Yes. So first he said, okay, we'll make the shirts intensely colored, yes. you know, so I get what I want. And then he went through and cut, saw how far he could cut back on dye. Yes. Okay, now we know we can cut back to here. That's the most expensive ingredient. That's where he put his dye levels at. He yes. would, then he cut back on urea until he hit the right level for the shirts he, he squirted on. Yes. He would tie the shirts, say with rubber band scrunches, they'd all be on one side. So then to untie the shirts, he'd just grab them by the corner and pull boom, yes. boom, over a piece of newspaper and all the rubber bands would fly off. Yes. He's the guy who taught me, you know, if you fix the shirts right, you get enough soda ash in it. All the dye is either bonded to the shirt Yes. Or it's exhausted and will not react. Yes. He never rinsed out anything. Everything went straight into the washing machine yes. immediately after he untied it. No, no rinsing, nothing, because he's just processing so many shirts up. And then he would get the soda, at, you know, so he had a special washing machine just for that. And it had a drain. He'd catch the soda ash from the shirts in a bucket. I mean, this stuff is black, right, from all the yes. dye. He would reuse it. Wow. So, I mean, I know how you're into recycling stuff and, you know, upcycling. So, he, the guy was really efficient about stuff, you know. Yes. He'd, burn, he'd buy a, a used Maytag washing machine about once a year because he'd burn them up. But, yes. uh, okay, that was that. I, I got one. I think I have one more piece of it somewhere. That's such a fantastic story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, no, it, it's like I said, you know, and the guy would like, you know, we'd go on vacation. I'd ask, he'd love to sit, talk to me about tie-dye. I'm like, dude. You're one of the best tie dyers I know. You're a pro. You do this all the time. Why do you want to talk to me? I'm just some amateur. And he says, because you just have to talk to somebody who knows what it's like <laughs> to put a bottle up to a shirt and when you go to squirt the dye on, it goes Lick! the wrong way instead of where you want and how frustrating it is. Like, okay, I get that. You know, I totally, you know, you just got to talk to somebody who like knows that, you know, it's like, whoa. You know, so I, okay. I love that after all of these years, you are still so passionate about it. Do you think you'll ever uh, yeah, get tired of it? Uh, it you, uh, the thing that actually I've been coming more and more um, entranced with it as time goes on because you know, when you do it and you have problems, say you make a batch of shirts and they don't come out the way you want or there's something not quite right, it's a little discouraging and puts you off when every shirt you make just hits right on, it's just hard to stop. I mean, there's the, you know, and as people say, what's your favorite part about tie-dyeing? 
you know, it is, and there's a, you know, something on Facebook where someone says, here's the picture of you when you untie your first shirt, it's big, happy smile. And then here's the picture of you when you untie your 30,000 shirt, it's the same big, happy smile. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing like that part where you open the shirt up and say, holy cow. I mean, with mine, you can't tell because they're just totally, you know, totally dark. We do reveals yes. as a joke on people because we untie the shirt. It's just when, when you do a good job of dying, the shirt's totally dark. You can't tell what's going on. Yes. So here's, this is the same Tom Fortmeyer. I mean, here's a washcloth we've been using for like 10, 15 years. You know, it's Fabulous. perfectly okay. You know, he, he would let the dye sit for maybe an hour and pull them out. Poop, and yes. they were done. Right? The yes. guy was amazing. Yes. Now he doesn't do it anymore. He quit after, I don't know, 10 years. The festival scene just, you know, having to go on tour and sell stuff, you know, do 40 or 50, you know, art festivals a year away from his family. The festival scene is like, uh, there's stuff involved there that you don't really want to, you know, it, it caused a schism in his family. So now he works at uh, Whole, Whole Foods in St. Louis somewhere. Okay. You know, I haven't seen him for a while, but, you know, so there's, there's, there's part of the influences I got. Okay, there was a rant for you, huh? It was absolutely fantastic. I'm entranced. I'm entranced. Thank you for that window into your world. Yeah, I've had practice telling these stories, okay? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, your, your Facebook group, Tie-Dying, I see right. at the moment it is mushrooming. You have hundreds of people joining you every week. Uh, how are you coping with that growth? Uh, well, we put up questions that people have to answer. So we weed out people that, as Glenn Fraser runs the group, basically, and Eric Lahoten, Lahoten okay. I can't pronounce his name. I, I'll mangle some tie dyers' names along, along <laughs> here. There's a few of them. Um, they do a lot of the work. Uh, Patsy Mole is on there. I think we tried to drag you into it, too. But you did, but I, one of my groups has got me very, very busy. <laughs> yeah, now, and so uh, Glenn put up these you know, four questions people have to answer. Um, and I'm like, well, you can't see some of the questions if you're on a phone. He's like, we don't want people on crappy phones. You know, it's just, <laughs> you know and I sit there, you know, I open up my computer, there's 10, you know, every, every hour there's 10 requests to join. Yes. So if you answer all the questions you're in, I don't even look at your Facebook profile anymore. I used to look at the profiles and say, you know, I'm not letting in racists and things like that in the group because they're going to cause trouble. I just let them in. You answer three out of the four questions, I'll probably let you in. You show tie dye, you know, and say I've been making tie dye, I probably let you in. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, other than that, I become a little hard, more hardcore about. No, nope, didn't answer. Bam, 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 bam. Go away, go away, go away. We just have so many people. Um, there was a about two or three years back where, geez, Dan. Oh God, I can't remember his name. He did a reveal video and it hit like you know two million views or something like that and all these people that started... video. what i remember that video yeah yeah and we we had hundreds of people per hour joining we just started letting them in wholesale because we couldn't go through them so uh, yeah it's it's mostly um it, it's mostly self-policing people are really good about you know the the people yes. who are showing up are really good about trying to follow the rules in general and telling you when someone doesn't do anything there's a uh, there's, there's, um, so, okay. So we are about to run out of time is the reason I'm raising my hand. Yeah, I can tell. I, I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story. That was absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm so thankful to finally be talking to you and to have heard your story. It was so inspiring. It's so inspiring to see your passion for this craft. And yeah, well, my wife says, Jesus, can't you get all those blanks out of the bedroom? You know, what are we going to do with this? Stuff? You got to sell it. You can't just make it, you know, what the heck. <laughs> Thank you for your time. I appreciate it so much. I'm sure you're going to inspire a whole new generation of tie dyers out there. We'll see. There's a lot of people out there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. See you later, Melanie. Bye.